log on. So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us and for uh, braving the heat. It's kind of nice to be able to stay in our homes and do this as opposed to having to drive someplace and when it's going to be uh, 90 degrees today. So uh, thank you for, for joining us and staying in your air conditioning also. Uh, my name is Ken Schmidt. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Turning Point Executive Search, as well as the Sales and Marketing Leadership Alliance. Uh, the SMLA is now nine years old. Uh, I started it with a colleague of mine, Brent, back in 2011, and uh, here we are in 2020. Uh, I was just talking a few minutes ago about the fact that uh, we're going to be continuing our virtual events, certainly through July and probably August. But as you might remember, we were planning on launching an Austin chapter also uh, back in April. And that was you know, put on hold, certainly. But we're going to do a soft virtual launch for Austin next month uh, with our first Austin-based speaker, uh, Jonathan Ford, who is a uh, senior inside sales professional over at Dialpad. So going forward, we'll have uh, Southern California speakers each month as well as Austin-based speakers to kind of mix things up a little bit. So uh, that should be a lot of fun. Uh, we do a lot in the way of sales and marketing recruiting with Turning Point. It's about, uh, about 60 to 70% of our recruiting is sales and marketing. So that's one of the, the big reasons for starting SMLA is to really kind of get the word out uh, about you know, how important it is for sales and marketing leaders to work together and more collaboratively. And we're very big believers, very big proponents uh, in getting companies to kind of see that combination and, and the strength of that combination uh, between sales and marketing. So our membership is comprised of people that are, you know, in either small business owners uh, or that are in sales and marketing capacity or in a field that supports the sales and marketing world. So it's a nice blend of, of experience and, and expertise that's uh, with us today. So thank you for joining us. Uh, in terms of what we are all about, as you'll, you'll see very quickly as we get started with Dan this morning, um, you know, we are really focused on making this an engaging conversation. We don't want it to be just a, a monologue uh, with myself and, and Dan talking at everybody. We really want to be engaged and we want to you know, encourage you all to ask questions, to bring up ideas, concerns, whatever it might be about your own business, about the banking world, about you know, being a small business owner, what's going to happen for the second part of the year. Um, anything that might, might come to mind, please feel free to ask the question in the chat and uh, myself and Dan will definitely uh, um, kind of respond to that also. I also just want to thank our sponsors. It's a little bit more difficult to do virtually versus in person, uh, but we have a great group of sponsors that has been very supportive uh, over the number of years. Uh, Brian Jackson and uh, both Rob and Terry uh, Sweetie with uh, Sandler Training have been supportive for a long time. Uh, Amy Rasdell also operations consulting with Billable at the Beach. Uh, we've got also Ryan uh, with uh, Replica um, Printers. Uh, we have Lauren over at um, Out and About Communications, Phil with his video production company, uh, and of course, Marsh McLennan uh, has been a big sponsor of us, and FranNet as well. So um, if you have any questions about our sponsors, if you need any support in any of those areas, by all means, reach out to myself or to Elaine. Uh, we can help with that and make some good introductions also. Uh, and then finally, I also want to just mention that we did roll out this month our new uh, virtual membership. Uh, we have a number of folks that have been logging on to these virtual calls that are not in a city where we have a physical presence. And we just thought, well, let's find a way to, to help get them more involved on a more regular basis, get them engaged with our regular membership also, but do it in a way that's going to make sense for them given you know, their, their location outside of, of Southern California. Uh, so our new virtual membership is up and running. We already have a handful of new members. So uh, which is great. We really appreciate you guys being involved uh, in that also. Okay, good. I think that's everything so far. Uh, we are going to, as Elaine just mentioned in the uh, chat box, we do what's called success trios or success quads. Uh, one of the things we've learned over the nine plus years of doing this group is that while it's great to make connections during the call or with the in-person events, uh, it can be a little bit tough sometimes to do a, a, a deeper dive and really get to know your fellow members. So um, if you are interested, please just uh, go ahead and email Elaine. She put her email address in the chat and then she will designate you as part of a success trio or success quad. Uh, send an email out so that you'll know who else is in your quad. And the idea is to do a, you know, set up a Zoom call. Uh, if you're comfortable, you can certainly do a coffee meeting if you like, but uh, most folks have been doing a Zoom call. Uh, just to do a deeper dive and to really understand a little bit more um, deeply, if you will, or uh, intimately what each person's business is all about, uh, how you can help them, how they can help you, uh, and the connections and the, the kind of the broad expertise that they have. So it's been very, very fruitful. Um, I have heard, I hear month after month about people getting jobs that way, uh, getting consulting business, uh, just making some great you know, connections. So I encourage you all to uh, email Elaine directly to be involved with that as well. 
Okay, enough with all those uh, uh, niceties. Let's go ahead and get started with our speaker this morning. Uh, so Dan Yates and I met, uh, gosh, last year, about a year or so ago. Uh, as you may have seen from his bio, he is the founder and CEO of Endeavor Bank. Uh, this is not his first go round with the bank. He also uh, launched uh, Regents Bank a number of years ago, and he's also a graduate from San Diego State undergrad. So a lot of, a lot of strong ties to the San Diego community. So welcome, Dan, thanks for being here this morning. It's a pleasure. Good to see you again. Yes, likewise, likewise. Even virtually, it's great to see each other. <laughs> yeah, indeed. That's all we do these days, right? Right, exactly, exactly, right. Uh, and Dan's a fellow uh, resident of North County here. Uh, he's, he lives here in the Aviar area in Carlsbad also, so uh, we have some strong ties to uh, North County. But um, Dan, why don't you start off by, for those that don't you know, don't know the intricacies of Endeavor Bank, maybe you can give us a feel for what the bank is all about, kind of what your charter is, uh, and really kind of why you started it. Sure. Uh, we, we went almost 10 years in San Diego without a new bank being formed. And that was also true across the, the whole country. And several years ago, a group of uh, business owners approached me to see if I would be willing to throw my uh, efforts into starting a new bank for San Diego. And my, I, was, I was open to it, but I wanted to do it very different from Regents, which you mentioned. I ran that bank for 12 years. And what I really wanted to do uh, different this time around and we did accomplish it, was to have the bank owned by the business community. So we have about 600 shareholders, and for the most part, they represent CEOs of private companies all over San Diego County. And the reason we, we formed that type of a capital structure is that the real heart and soul of the bank is, is what we call consultative banking. So I spend more time doing whiteboarding, brainstorming, problem solving for business owners than I do lending money and handling the depository accounts. That's how we make our money. But the real fun uh, for me is to uh, just really put business owners together in the same room and try to uh, make connections, deep networking, kind of like you're doing today, and see if we can help uh, businesses thrive by um, solving the most pressing issues that we all face and, and really coming up with uh, key introductions. And so that's really what, what Endeavor Bank does. And I would say from a, from a who's our ideal client, it's really businesses that are privately held in every industry in San Diego. And we occasionally will go outside into uh, you know, Orange County, LA, but it's pretty much a local bank. So I'm curious, was it, was, did, did it take a lot of um, explaining, if you will, or educating for, um, for clients, customers to, know, to understand what that truly meant? Because every, every person, every banker out there says, oh yes, we're relationship based, right? No one says that we're not. Um, but obviously you, you are literally, you know, kind of, kind of walking the walk and talking the talk. Um, so how, how did you, how did you um, overcome that maybe cynicism or skepticism about uh, truly being consultative? I think for me, I had the advantage of being in CEO peer groups for years. Uh, I was a longtime Vistage member. Currently I'm an EO. Uh, my business partner, Steve, our president, he's been in Sage and, uh, uh, convene and, and what we found is that if you if you're a CEO who has been inside of a peer group you understand the needs of entrepreneurs and your your typical banker is not going to be a CEO of a bank they won't be in those rooms they won't be part of those conversations and once you have been in a confidential meeting with business owners and you hear that there are issues that our industry does not do a great job of solving then relationship banking, it gets way overplayed in terms of a term. And if, if you just look at the last two months, there's probably never been a better case for this type of banking with PPP. The largest banks in the country, which all I think do a good job of talking about service, um, did not do a great job in terms of answering questions that business owners had with PPP and how to apply for it and how to, how to seek forgiveness. and. There, there, was so, there was so much concern among the business community about this whole uh, uh, PPP process that um, community banks uh, like Endeavor and others across the nation, <clears throat> I think, really stepped up and, um, and really showed what relationship banking means. No, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, I, I ended up going through Chase and um, I was really, as you said, you know, I was really kind of just left on my own. And they would send updates every so often, but it was, it was very canned. I mean, they, and they did a good job. I was able to secure the loan in the second round, but, uh, but I, I didn't really have an expert to go to to ask questions of, 
other than my CPA. So that, that was definitely something certainly missing from the big banks without question. Yeah. It'll become even more critical now as companies seek uh, forgiveness of those loans. Right, and exactly. It is never easy because the, you change the rules every five minutes, as you know, and um, I yeah. probably filled a you know, hundred questions a day for different clients. Just, you know, when do I have to hire employees back and, uh, you know, how does this formula work? And in many, many cases, we don't have the answers either because the, the rules change on, on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so how have you handled, I, I, I would imagine there's been a, bit, a pretty big influx of questions coming in. Have you had to beef up you know, either a call center or folks that were in the virtual branch to be able to answer those questions? Not really. We've, we hired a number of interns to help us with the process, but the, the questions, the higher level questions, our senior team is really uh, the ones in, in charge of answering that. So myself, our president, three or four of our uh, senior vice presidents, uh, we just spread those around. And, you know, we made um, close to 140 million of PPP loans, and that represented 600 uh, clients. So they don't all have the same questions the same day, but at the peak, there may have been a thousand emails a day that we were trying to get to. And wow. the, the truthful answer is we put in 20 hour days uh, to get to all those answers. And that, that's something you can't sustain over a long period of time, but we did for about two months. And it was, it was a bit exhausting, but that's <laughs> I'm sure. How, how did you, and I know obviously the, the focus of our discussion today is about pivoting in general, but um, from a banking perspective, how, how, did, how did you ensure that your, your staff, your team, interns and otherwise, were up to speed for, you know, coming in the morning first thing, being prepared for those thousand emails and, you know, a number of phone calls also? Did you do stand-up meetings that were virtual? How did you prepare the, the, the team for that? We did a lot of Zoom uh, huddle meetings where okay. we, would, uh, we would meet uh, as, as we saw trends coming. Um, for example, I would start to get the same question asked over and over again by different clients. Mm -hmm. And I would figure out how to answer that effectively, but I needed to make sure I shared my answers with my team. So I would do two things. One is get everybody on a call in the morning and talked about what we're hearing, how to answer it. So we were giving a consistent response as a bank. And then I would copy and share uh, the more detailed responses that I would come up with for the really deep, sophisticated questions. And so often with PPP, it was um, mind numbing, the questions that, that borrowers would come up with. And I would have to spend hours researching that information, going to different uh, sources and it's great if I come up with the, uh, the best answer, but if I don't share that with my team, then everyone's coming to me. So you have to really make sure that everyone is equipped to, to be uh, effective in answering those questions to reassure everyone. Sure. Well, and as you said earlier, I mean, there's no, no better way to, to test that model of being truly consultative than to have this kind of a situation go on. I mean, the fact that you as the CEO of the bank are the one doing the research on these questions and then disseminating your, your uh, findings to the team, that really goes a long way to explain that as well. That's, that's fantastic. And just FYI, one of, one of actually our, our members that's on the call today, Sanjeev, um, uh, over at Bytes, he uh, was just appreciative of getting his PPP loan through you and Endeavor Bank. So a um, little shout out for you there. That's great. Um, so first question is from uh, Joseph, and he's asking about kind of uh, the, the, the mechanism you have, if you will, for bringing in clients. And, and maybe a, a, a follow on to that is, how does that differ from what a typical bank does, you know, a non-consultative bank in terms of bringing new customers and clients in? Well, that's a great question. So in our case, it's almost all been shareholder driven. So with 600 business owners, uh, they swim in pools or uh, other uh, peers. And so they have skin in the game. They're excited about the bank. They enjoy referring their friends and associates to the bank. And so for the first two years, I would receive on average uh, any given day, 10 to 20 inbound um, introductions to business owners, all coming from 600 shareholders wow. who themselves are business owners. Then secondly, we have a uh, advisory board of about 25 shareholders, <clears throat> excuse me, who are also CEOs they meet in triads and they come up with strategies to help us grow the bank. And a, an example might be where we have one member of the team who's a retired dentist 
He is on the Trade Association for the Dental Community, and he came up with the idea that many uh, retiring colleagues are looking to sell their practice. So why don't we come up with a um, credit facility that will help a new dentist buy an, a retiring dentist practice? And they come up with all these different strategies like that on the advisory board that we then deploy to our team. And in addition to those uh, probably the most typical ways we develop business, the, the next area is we put on events throughout the year. An example might be, uh, well, most of you have been to an economic summit in this case. The difference is in our, in our events, they're almost all shareholder participants and they're almost all CEOs. And so they're networking among themselves. And that networking just naturally leads to uh, business coming towards the bank. So it is a really different way of, uh, of building an organization when you have so many owners that are locally based. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and uh, back to the theme of, of pivoting as well, have you been able to translate those uh, meetings and those, those uh, discussions that you talked about that, are, that were normally in person, have you translated those to being online now? Is that still happening? Yeah, the last two months have been very surreal for us, and, and I would say most banks. We doubled the size of our bank in about two months' time, um, mainly because of PPP. Wow. Uh, as you know, there were two rounds. So in round one, most banks, Endeavor included, we, we focused on our clients. But in round two, what happened is that a lot of the large banks uh, had clients that were waiting and waiting for round one to uh, result in a loan. It didn't happen. They weren't willing to go through it a second time. And so we had a tremendous amount of clients approach us in round two and bring their business to us. And that's why the bank uh, doubled in size. But to do that, we didn't have the, the time uh, to get out in front of all these clients and do what would normally be a full conversation to get to know the business, their business model, look at their financial statements, what we would normally do to bring in a new relationship. In this case, we were getting payroll information only. Uh, almost all of that was email. Uh, we might have a phone call, might have a Zoom meeting, oftentimes neither of those, and the business came in. And now that the, the frenzy has uh, slowed down, we're able to go back to the clients and now say, we made your PPP loan. We probably opened up an account for you, but now let's talk about the rest of your banking needs. And so we'll be spending the next six months to a year uh, following up on the opportunities that only came about because of the PPP. In many cases, Ken, those were relationships that have been with banks for 10, 20 years that would have never left otherwise, but it right. created catalyst for us to have an opportunity. You know, I guess that's the silver lining of what uh, we've all been through. Right, exactly, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a big part of what I've been talking to clients about also is, is you know, are they, are they taking this as, a, as an opportunity, if you will, if you can find a very small silver lining in, in what's happening in the world, um, but are they taking this as an opportunity to figure out how to, how to either pivot completely or to offer new solutions, new, offer new um, uh, products or services as well to their clients. Uh, or converting the the kind of the platform that they've been accustomed to to something that's virtual. I mean, this the SMLA here is a great example of that. Um, so yeah. we're seeing that out there as well. Um, a quick question from one of our members also. Just uh, and my understanding is that people, if you already received funding from the first round for the PPP loan, you're not able to get a second round of funding. Correct? It's, it's one 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 funding, if you will, one loan per per business. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What, um, just to kind of, I guess, last question about that, but what do you, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think there'll be any other changes coming down the pike? I know obviously last week they, uh, both the Senate and the House finally passed everything. So now we've got the extension where we have 24 weeks versus eight weeks to use it. Um, it's only 60% of the funds that you get that are forgivable have to be for payroll versus the original amount, 75%. Do you see any other changes coming down the pike or do you think this is probably going to be where everything settles in? So the industry, my industry is pushing very hard to have 150,000 and below just be a certification that um, the loan should be naturally forgiven. No, oh, interesting. First, filling out the paperwork and proving that you spent it on payroll or what other is a cover, considered a covered expense. Uh, we're trying to create a safe harbor to reduce the burden on both the business owners and, and the bank side for at least the smaller, we will call the smaller loans of 150,000. Mm -hmm. Will it happen? I don't know, but there's a strong um, 
movement among the banks, uh, trade associations, and the bank leaders to have Congress take a look at that. Is, is that is that coming from the the uh, large you know banks as well as the community and regional banks as well? Absolutely. No, oh, I didn't know that. Interesting. Okay. Well, as as somebody who's in that you know in that category of less than one hundred fifty thousand, I, I hope that goes through. That would be wonderful. <laughs> make make my life a lot easier. <laughs> No promises, but it's getting a lot of attention right now. Okay, that's good to know. Very good, very good. Um, so I, I want to chat a little bit about just kind of your experience with um, starting the bank, right? And having, you know, kind of lessons learned from when you started and ran Regents versus when you started Endeavor Bank, uh, you know, a few years ago also. Um, let me talk to us about the difference, the differences, if you will, in the banking community, obviously, you know, pre-COVID, but um, talk to us about that, if you would. Well, when I started Regents, uh, it was not that unusual to start a bank. We had maybe 20 in, inside of about a two-year period just here in San Diego. We had maybe 1,000 in Southern California during the, say, 1999 to 2007 time period. So the regulators were well aware of how to go about the process, um, and it was a pretty painless process. Uh, period of time for me to start Regents, maybe it took 11 months. Hmm. It could have been more different in, in terms of starting Endeavor. The, the regulators who were accustomed to starting banks had retired, very few had ever done it, believe it or not, and they were very concerned about uh, being embarrassed. <laughs> and what had happened is in Orange County, a group tried to start a bank uh, right about a year before we did Endeavor, and they did not succeed in raising their capital and it really spooked the regulators. And so when we came along in the heels of that, there were, there were more concerns about how are you gonna raise your capital? How do you know there's a need for a new bank? And it took us uh, almost four years from the idea to opening the bank as opposed to Regents which took 11 months. Hmm. Wow. And there was investor fatigue, organizer fatigue, management team fatigue, and there were times when I think there were people who thought it would never happen. And you just had to push through every hurdle that they put in front of us. And I eventually um, met with the FDIC after the fact and gave them uh, some feedback on what they needed to change if they want to see more banks created in the country. And they really took it to heart and they've made serious changes. So now we have probably 20 new banks across the U.S. In, um, since Endeavor opened. And there may be more in the future, but um, it is it was definitely much more difficult. And I'm not sure if I knew in the beginning it was going to take me four years, I would have uh, started the endeavor, no pun intended. But it's been worth it since then. Well, that, that's a pretty big change, yeah, especially like you said, with the, I mean, the regulators in, in, in normal times are always tough to kind of work through. But if they yeah. were already kind of spooked by what happened up in Orange County, I'm sure it just made them that much more cautious. That's interesting. So, and I, I can't recall if you, if, if your um, 600 or so clients out there, are they uh, concentrated in a specific industry or a couple of industries? And I'd like to know kind of what you're seeing from them and kind of what those, what those businesses are talking about and kind of what they are, are expecting um, for as far as business goes in the second half of the year. Yeah, I think there are sectors that we tend to have more clients in, like the construction trades, subcontractors, general contractors, have quite a few of those, uh, machine shops, um, you know, believe it or not, manufacturing is a big part of our base, uh, and then the service sector, everything from uh, dental offices, doctors, uh, attorneys, but it runs the gamut. If there was one common theme, um, we don't really have a lot of private equity-backed companies or venture-backed companies, unlike, say, a Silicon Valley Bank or Square One, some of those banks that are more uh, venture-focused in the biotech community. Ours tend to be more, um, for lack of a better term, we'll call it bread-and-butter businesses. And, and it runs, there's you know, thousands of industries that are not in biotech in San Diego that need banks. And so that's kind of our focus is the more traditional privately held companies. Great. Yeah, everybody's always surprised when, when someone says there is manufacturing still going on in San Diego, right? It's, it's still a pretty, pretty robust uh, part of the economy. So in terms of what you're seeing from, from these clients, uh, and thanks for giving us kind of a, a lay of the land for the types of, of, of customers that you're working with, what, what's kind of the mood? What are they, what are they talking about? Are, they, are many of them changing their business plans or 
you know, beginning to offer a whole new uh, line of business, if you will? Yeah, I, I'm seeing uh, pivoting happening daily with just a number of clients. Um, examples would be, a, let's say, a catering company. Um, catering came to a screeching halt. So, you know, companies that maybe were doing five million a year in revenue went to zero. So that what they do instead, they started in one case, uh, I can think of a company that started uh, creating a delivery at home of highly catered foods and replaced their revenue in a matter of two months and eliminated the Grubhubs and the Uber Eats as which is a high cost uh, for restaurants and decided to deliver in person. Um, a well-known company I think most of us know from North County is Jazzercise. Uh, they were in the paper the other day. You may have read their story. Um, they decided to create virtual delivery of their, you know, Jazzercise product and increase membership by 16% um, when it was heading down uh, very rapidly. And so uh, more and more companies are either looking for products that they didn't sell before or a different way of delivering their service. So let's take a restaurant. Um, if, if, as we're all venturing out to eat now, you're noticing there are more uh, restaurants that are taking over their parking lots to do patios serving as a way to deal with the, uh, the, the, the density that we now have to have to eat. Or you're gonna see examples of companies that are sourcing product that was not in need before. So I have uh, manufacturers that are making plastic shields. Mm -hmm. I have companies that are manufacturing um, unique products that allow you to open doors without touching the handles so that uh, businesses can um, uh, make it feel more comfortable for their customers to not have to touch physical door sets or door handles or restrooms and so forth. And uh, we have companies that are looking for ways to sell um, things like masks that have uh, uh, marketing insignia of your company on those because we're all going to be wearing masks for a while. Mm -hmm. And if you were in the promotional products business and all of a sudden nobody is spending money on, on promotional products, but you need a mask, you marry the two. Mm -hmm. On those examples are, are happening and we're, we're seeing them daily with our clients. And I'm curious, are there, I mean, back to what you said earlier about being a very consultative bank and that's your whole approach and really your whole mission. Are, are you getting calls from these businesses? asking and hey dan and we're thinking about pivoting in this way or offering this or offering that is there that dialogue going on just so they understand so they can have a kind of fresh set of eyes to look at or are these companies kind of doing this in a, in a silo kind of deciding on their own uh to make these changes no we spent a lot of time consulting with them um, a good a good friend who i met years ago who provides sales training for banks uh he approached me and he said uh none of the banks in the country are hiring me to do sales training. And I said, well, of course not, because the banking industry just had a tremendous increase in volume. There's no one's thinking about uh, needing to do any kind of sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. But I said to him, what we do need is, is a, a way to take all of these PPP um, one-off loans and convert them into full-scale clients. So I worked with him on a marketing piece where he could address all the hot buttons and, and the hot buttons were where do you come up with the money to devote to sales training well banks just made a lot of money off the ppp income they made they now have some uh, time in between uh, the origination of the loans and the forgiveness piece so i helped him customize um, the type of marketing letter that i as a ceo of a bank might be receptive to he sent it out to about 400 bank CEOs nationwide. And he picked up 10 new clients that were going to turn out to be wonderful for him. Wow. So it was really taking the time to understand better what I'm dealing with. And if I were going to buy a service, what would it need to, how would it need to come to me? What form? And what would be my hot buttons? And how do you overcome that? So we do that with different industries. That's, a, that's what I know particularly well because I'm a potential client of that service. But it right. also works going the other way uh, i'll also share that everybody likes to jump on a hot theme so we all like ppp because it was a potentially free money right so i'm seeing businesses that have come up with their own ppp selling everything from outsourced uh, it services to giving away uh, months of free uh, uh, financial planning for for employees of companies who have been impacted by the stock market or their jobs 
and they're marketing this kind of a, a PPP giveaway for their product or service. Very creative, and it actually is is working for them. Do you, I'm curious, I was reading an article in, in the uh, journal, I think, just over the weekend uh, about companies now trying to figure out you know, what what portion of their of their expenses, their costs that they've had to incur to get you know their 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 plants up to speed, or in Costco's case, to put up all the plastic shields, those kinds of things. You know, what percentage of those investments are going to be with us indefinitely, and what uh, which ones are going to are kind of just a a stopgap measure, if you will. I'm curious about what your what your clients are saying to you if they are making these pivots. Um, indefinitely, that this is going to be part of their service offering going forward, or is it just you know a six month interval until things return to some sort of normal? Yeah, we don't have a large uh, you know retail client base, but it's primarily on the retail side where you're seeing a lot of those expenses. Where where there's concern is in the fine dining areas. Um, not only are they having to separate the uh, the seating areas so or you know, six feet apart. But now changing uh, the airflows in the restaurants. Um, for, for many of the fine dining establishments, they just can't make sense out of it. We have a couple that have not reopened, even though they're allowed to, just because the economics aren't there. Mm -hmm. They're studying it, trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in some industries, changes are going to be permanent, mainly in the, in the restaurant trade. Even, even if they're not required to uh, remain from a legal standpoint, I think consumer behaviors have changed and there's a fear factor that will linger for some uh, consumers for a while. Uh, and as that um, is the case, uh, businesses are gonna to have to adapt permanently to bring people back into the establishments. I've even heard with retail shopping, if you think about when you went to uh, Disneyland, uh, some of the more popular rides, you would get a buzzer and it would tell you when you can go get in line. Well, now we're talking about doing that in some of the shopping centers where you don't want to wait a long line to shop so you'll have a reservation when to come. I mean, very creative solutions to get uh, consumers back into the stores. Wow. I, I don't know if you have any um, customers or insight into the commercial real estate space, but are you, are you hearing from any of those folks about ways that they're going to pivot as well? I mean, you got to figure with all, I mean, the, the brick and mortar establishments were already kind of on the decline. <clears throat> yeah, pardon me, on the decline already, pardon me. Um, but I'm wondering kind of what's going to happen with commercial real estate, you know, all the WeWork spaces that are going to be, you know, less occupied, if at all. Uh, do you have any insights into that, that part of the, of the uh, economy also? Yeah, that's not a, bit, not a very bright spot right now. I think most commercial real estate is uh, say, somewhat on hold. I, I'm hearing stories of um, as leases are coming up, Businesses are not rushing to renew those. They want to revisit uh, their business model. Um, so, so many uh, companies that I know uh, have overcome the psychology of allowing their employees to work from home. And I say psychology because there, there tends to be fear that if I don't see my employee, I don't know they're working productively. And once you have overcome that fear, you see that they actually are working productively. Now you're willing to entertain a permanent um, arrangement where certain employees will never be back in the workforce. And if that remains the case, that then translates into, do I need this much space I had before? And I'll use our bank as an example. We had um, no room left in our downtown headquarters office. Uh, every time I would hire an employee, we were faced with, where are we going to put them? Now I have a tremendous amount of workspace that's not being used, and I probably will not extend uh, the square footage of my downtown office. And I have employees that very easily adapted to working at home. They're not client facing. They're they're typically like a control the bank. Uh, they're working on reports, uh, general ledger stuff all day long. I don't need that individual to be sitting in an expensive office in downtown San Diego up on the 31st floor of the Symphony Tower. They can work out of their home and they're happy to. So we have examples of that and every company does. Yeah, and I think you know, even from our, our world and the recruiting side, it's going to be interesting to see how this work from home, you know, kind of uh, experiment, as a lot of people are calling it, uh, plays out. I mean, we've, we've from the demand side from candidates, we've actually been hearing from people for the last, you know, two and a half years 
while the war for talent was accelerating, you know, candidates would say, I'm, I'm happy to make a job change, but I'm not going to make a job change that's going to force me to go into an office five days a week. Uh, yeah. they, either, they either already are used to working from home or that's one of the perks that they want to move to, which would compel them to make a job change. Um, but a lot of companies on the, on the kind of demand side, if you will, uh, a lot of companies were, were very resistant to doing that. And to your point before, I, I call that, you know, line of sight management. If I can't see you, how can I manage you? Uh, and a lot of companies were very fearful of what would happen to productivity and efficiency and collaboration and innovation um, if everybody was dispersed and working out of their home offices. So, and certainly there are some roles that are more conducive to working remotely than others, definitely. But we on the recruiting side are now saying, okay, so if, if these companies are now you know, willing to consider it, that's going to open up a much larger uh, talent pool for them when it comes to doing recruiting you know, for us on their behalf, rather than just looking in their own backyard, we can now go anywhere. Uh, and conceivably can save them some money by finding somebody in a less expensive part of the country as well. I have a client that shared an interesting story uh, the other day. They had reached out to the Philippines to hire an executive assistant, and they used this to do some of the recruiting. As it turned out, um, they hired an employee, and the employee showed up first day at the office, and he wanted to meet Bob. And the, as the story goes, well, Who's Bob? Well, Bob, who's I've been talking to on the phone for the last several weeks, and they said, oh, well, Bob offices elsewhere. They said, oh, is it Alpine? Well, what do you mean Alpine? Well, whenever Bob calls, we see Alpine pop up on the phone. And they finally gave it up, and they said, well, actually, Bob works in the Philippines. And they were shocked because uh, he was very professional. He knew the business. He came across on Zoom and other uh, forms of communication as though he worked right there in downtown San Diego. And now they're thinking of taking more their job openings and place them uh, outside of the United States because they've had such a great experience. We need to see more of that. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I agree. And I think a lot of that is as, as long as the, the training and the onboarding piece is there, you really can have somebody just about anywhere these days, which is true. Uh, and, and actually to that point, another question that came up from the group from Joseph um, is, is, you know, how do you, how do you build that camaraderie? How do you maintain that level of engagement? So all your employees still feel like they are contributing to the, to the same cause, if you will, when we don't see each other face to face, when everybody's working from home dispersed, do you, do you have any, any things that you've instituted at, at the bank that have helped to, to, you know, uh, kind of continue to build that, that, uh, camaraderie? It's, it's a work in process that, uh, I have the same concerns. We're, we're doing uh, Zoom meetings with the attack, um, and that seems to help to a certain degree. But I, I do think it helps to have employees come physically into the office at least uh, once a week, um, anticipate, even if it's in we, we use a, uh, um, a platform called Traction, or EOS, that you be familiar with. And it's, it's about 6,000 companies use that. With, with traction, you can have a weekly meeting with first the executive team of, of a company, in our case, the bank, and then you move it, it cascade it down throughout the organization. And you have weekly goals, weekly uh, talk about um, to do's, rocks. These are big things you have to get done in a quarter. And I think as you have a system like that, there's also one that many companies use called Scale Up, very similar. But if you have an operating system like that, it really helps to build the, uh, the, the team culture and hold everyone accountable. And I think for us, uh, using EOS has been a very important tool to build that camaraderie as you mentioned. That's great, yeah. No, I agree. And our business has been virtual since day one, so it's been 13 years for us, and we've, it's still a work in progress, let me tell you. It's, you, know, you do things one day, but you, you know, as, a, as a leader, I always want to make sure, my biggest concern is that, you know, is everybody staying connected and, and feeling connected uh, when we're all doing our own you know, disparate things out there? Uh, it, we're only a team of five. I can imagine you know, companies that have thousands of employees. Um, that's, that's no easy task to keep that, uh, you know, keep that camaraderie and that connection going. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so back to the, the um, uh, discussion earlier about pivoting. What are, are you, are you seeing, and we talked about this a little bit offline uh, kind of in preparation for today. One of the things you talked about was, you know, the, the, the changing landscape for how companies get loans, right? Based on changing their business, based on, you know, assets or no assets. 
Um, mm -hmm. Are you seeing, again, more of a, more of a, a long-term change there? Or do you feel like it's more of a temporary situation that we're just trying to use a stopgap? The biggest change for, for all banks right now is use of you over the past many years, I've always looked at historical financial performance as a predictor of the future. And there's a certain degree of probability if a company has made money for three years running and you go through the normal reel of what does the future look like, it's not a big stretch to uh, connect. But right now, the past is not as easily a predictor of the future. But we're spending more time in six month forecasts and really drilling down and how um, shutting down the economy affected not just the client's um, revenues, but their supply and everything in between. So you really need more of a forecast to look ahead to make loan decisions than ever before. And um, the, the past historical financial performance, seen if it looked wonderful in 2019, may bear no reflection on where they're doing today. Mm -hmm. We really have to... Um, to get much deeper into understanding the business than ever before we're going to make a sound loan decision. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about just, you know, loan covenants and all those things that were put in place with a more uh, predictable, if you will, or consistent uh, cash flow. But now obviously with this huge disruption, everybody's going to be scrambling towards mm -hmm. the end of the year, depending upon what their covenants look like to make sure that they're, they're staying up to speed and, and able to meet those. Yeah, and it, what I'm seeing is a, a pretty big uh, need for outsourced, uh, you know, CFO services. There are a lot of firms that do that in San Diego, and I think that has been very helpful. Those companies can really augment what tools business owners have to create some 12 month forecasts, and with those, you can then adjust the covenants accordingly to reflect where we are right now. There's a there's another loan program coming out that you may have heard about called the Main Street Lending Program. And this week, the Treasury reduced the size of 250000 So a lot of companies will be looking at that program to help them deal with existing loans that maybe are out of uh, compliance with their bank. Because it's a, I think it's a 95% guarantee on the part of the U.S. Treasury, which is a pretty attractive uh, loan vehicle for banks. And I think for companies that have been hard hit, that might be another uh, way to help them get through this crisis. No, that's, that's a good point. Well, and a, and a lot of our members are SMLA and folks that are on the, on the call today are small business owners, you know, a, a small handful of employees or, you know, 15, 20, 30 employees or so. Uh, and we're all trying to figure out exactly how to, how to navigate this for sure. Based on, on and I know there, there's a, a definite disconnect out there between what we're seeing on Wall Street and the new record highs on NASDAQ and the, the market just kind of going crazy a separation or disconnect between Wall Street and you know, Main Street, what's happening in, in all of our lives as small business owners, which is the real driver for the economy. What, in your opinion, what do you think, what do you see coming down the pike for the second half of the year uh, in terms of the recovery? How do you think it's gonna play out? You know, I'm, I'm optimistic with the exception of unemployment. Uh, unemployment is gonna really make it difficult for those who, uh, who have been displaced to spend money and so, on the one hand, you're seeing the market um, doing well this week. You're, you're seeing segments uh, of, of the industry, of certain industries doing very well as they're going to come back. So I think it's going to be spotty where you will find real large examples in, in different states as they open sooner than others. Certain industries that are bouncing back quickly, companies who are pivoting. And then when you apply it to the whole uh, economy, uh, a little less uh, rosy because it would, I don't see unemployment dropping much below 10% by the end of the year. So until you get unemployment under control, and you know we're right now higher than we have been since the Great Depression, um, there's no way you can uh, eliminate that type of loss of uh, earning power and how it translates into buying products and services. So um, cautiously optimistic that there will be some real good uh, examples of companies that are going to thrive and, and just you know what recession but if you just want to define the economy at large it's, it's going to be hard to uh, to see us getting out of the any time in the next year i think we're going to be in for about a year recession yeah no, i think that makes perfect sense and i've had uh clients and contacts ask me if i think it's going to be a u-shaped recovery or v-shaped 
And I said, I, I kind of see a W. I think it's going to be kind of, you know, up and down and up and down where it is not, it's not a straight line by any stretch. But to your point, we'll see certain pockets, industries, sectors, regions of the country that'll do very well and others that'll still be suffering for a little bit longer, definitely. I'm curious about your um, uh, tactics, if you will, or kind of your approach now on the marketing side. I've talked to a few colleagues of mine that actually own marketing agencies, and some of them have actually started to see an uptick, similar to what you talked about with companies outsourcing uh, CFO and accounting services as well. I'm seeing that on the marketing side too. Uh, and a lot of them are talking about how their clients are, are coming to them saying, you know, we need not, not just a brand refresh, but really kind of a rebranding initiative to make sure people understand what we're doing, that we're still you know, going concern, we're doing very well as a business, um, but to get out there and cut through all the noise as well. Are, I'm, I'm curious, A, what you're seeing, if anything, on the marketing side with your clients, but then also what you're doing as Endeavor Bank uh, on your marketing, if that's changed at all. Yeah, for, first for clients, I think there are some really good buys in the media right now. And I'm seeing more clients take advantage of, of using the media in ways they've never done before. And most businesses, if they're re-pivoting, have to do some rebranding to deliver that information to the market. So you, you're seeing examples uh, across industry. But what we're doing is really trying to focus on the low-hanging fruit. During our last capital raise, I always get the question, we've been in this long, um, growth period in our economy. Should I invest in a bank if we go into a recession? And I've always had some of my best years in banking in recession because it's all about um, laser focusing on what companies do well when the economy is at the largest not doing well. And I've seen more examples right now than ever before of companies that are almost embarrassed to say out loud that they are actually doing better and a high percentage, um, it's probably not good for the media to get in the headline, but a high percentage of those who took PPP money are actually doing quite well. And what will happen, in my opinion, is they will have competitors who will not survive, but they're going to have a fresh injection of capital as a result of PPP, and they'll be able to take advantage of market share that they might otherwise have not had that opportunity. And so if you're very selective in who you do business with, those uh, companies are, that are already doing well will get even stronger as we go into um, the rest of this year and some of their competitors drop by the wayside. So it's really a matter of just you know, picking good clients to uh, align yourself with as a bank and um, every, everyone will do well. And so we've, we're fortunate in that we're somewhat young, less than three years old. And so so many of our clients um, are just uh, right now doing extremely well. That's great. That's good to hear. And I think, you know, a large part of that is because they do have someone like yourself you know, and the bank as a whole as that consultant, as kind of that sounding board. So when they do make any decisions about investing or about uh, redeploying capital, they're doing it in a smart way versus kind of a trial and error fashion, if you will. So yeah, and I'm, I don't know if this question is more for uh, on the insurance side than, than where you sit, but uh, uh, Joseph had asked the question about, you know, for companies that have had their, their uh, retail, if you will, establishments affected or, or distribution centers um, by looting or some of the riots out there. It hasn't been you know, as widespread as you might think based on how the media covers it. But um, regardless, any, any insights about how those businesses are doing or uh, any local examples there? I really don't have uh, you know, much to draw upon yet. I think that'll, that'll be in the next few weeks. We'll see more of that, but not because we don't have too many retail clients, I really haven't been uh, directly uh, exposed to it. Um, where I thought you were going though, which is something I can speak to, is a lot of businesses have been able to file claims uh, against their insurance for business interruption in areas that are really technical. Uh, a good example is we have a nonprofit client that uh, puts on theater performances in Carlsbad, uh, New Village Arts. And they were able to file a claim and actually receive funding under their insurance policy for the business interruption of not putting on theater performances. Something I would not have thought about, uh, but it's, it, it, it worked for their, uh, their business and others that are uh, similarly uh, focused. That's great. So, so for those of us that um, are either with bigger banks or, or you know, uh, large banks, if you will, 
uh, and we don't have a, a you know, kind of banking confidant, if you will, to go to. Um, do you see that most of your customers are coming from a large bank because they're missing that and they, they, they want that consultative approach and so they come to you? Is that something that you would suggest folks look into, especially in these times? Over the, over the course of my career, almost all of my clients come out of large banks. I don't usually compete with other community banks. I think by and large, community banks have a similar um, reputation for being very customer oriented, uh, very much uh, doing a deeper dive. But for companies that have only been with a large bank, they don't have a basis of comparison. If we can get in front of them, or any community bank can get in front of them, this is true nationwide. Usually where community banks can uh, demonstrate a different approach, and certainly here at Endeavor with our, our consultative theme, is really to do a much deeper dive on a business and get to know the clients and the intricacies of that company at a level that's very hard to do consistently when you're with a large bank. And I've, you know, I've spent time with a couple of large banks in my career, and it wasn't that I was a different person, but just the culture didn't lend itself to doing that. No pun intended there, but it just doesn't work well when you're inside of a large organization sometimes. Very true, very true. Well, and to that point then, I'm, I'm curious, how do you, because um, I know in, in banking, similar to recruiting actually, people do tend to stay within the industry for a long time and they will, will bounce you know, from one firm to the next. But obviously with the, as different as you are, and it's actually very similar to us at Turning Point also, but with as different as you are and very consultative, how, A, do you look for folks that are coming from outside the banking industry when you're hiring? And then B, what kind of a, of a, a screening process, vetting process do you put them through to make sure that they will actually fit into that culture of Endeavor Bank? It's difficult. Uh, over the years, I have found that if I, if I hire somebody from a large bank who has never spent any time in community banking, uh, they, they have a struggle because in a large bank, clients come to you through the system. In other words, if I, if I hired a banker and they said, I produced X amount of uh, new business last year, I asked the next question, where did you get that business? It oftentimes was, was referred from the branch network. Well, in community banking, there's no branch network to feed you business. You have to go out and find that business. Um, and so there's, there's not a transferable skill in that example if it just shows up that you have a client to serve. So with, with most community bankers, they've learned over the course of their careers that they have to go out and differentiate themselves differently than having the brand of a large bank that sells for you. And so I've been able to occasionally help uh, that transition from somebody coming out of large banks. But usually where I look for uh, bankers is somebody who's um, developed the skills coming up through community banking. And I've, you know, I've, I've had some success recruiting straight out of college. And uh, it's a longer process to bring somebody uh, through the career path. But uh, certainly it's, it's easier to do that than just to hire somebody from a large institution that is really not familiar with the culture of community banking. Yeah, definitely. Do you, so, uh, and, and this kind of speaks to, uh, to some extent to the uh, discussion we had earlier about your um, investors, you know, being very consultative and helping each other out as well. Are you seeing CEOs being, you know, kind of more willing to share the challenges, the issues that they're having and, and looking for support from other CEOs also? Or are people getting kind of, kind of uh, looking inward and becoming more insular and just trying to hunker down and survive right now? The former, I, I see more business owners are willing to sit down and, uh, you know, open up the kimono and talk about their concerns, what they're, what they're struggling with, um, whether it's employees working the, from home for the first time, how they how they deal with the technology and, and the devices that everyone has to rely upon. And how do you, how do you keep that secure? Or maybe it's an issue about, um, you know, they've lost a certain segment of their revenues and how do they pivot? And they're listening to examples of other CEOs faced with similar, similar circumstances that pivoted successfully and drawing upon that. So, you know, nobody has all the answers in a private company, certainly not the CEO. And I think once you're willing to open up and uh, you know, share your issues, you'll get more back from uh, all those who want to help. And I think that is a very common theme among almost all of our clients right now. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
I know you and I were talking a little bit offline about uh, the, the, the car that you bought recently. I think you, you, your wife bought recently. And we were yeah. talking about the whole kind of, kind of uh, move towards contactless as a, as a marketing tactic, if you are, as a, as a marketing message. Uh, whether you see the commercials for Burger King or whatever else out there where it's all about being contactless uh, and you had the experience, you know, buying and selling your car also. Do you see, is, is that part of the conversation with many of your clients trying to figure out how do we do this in a contactless uh, way or a way that we can minimize contact? Yeah, I mean, it's looking at, for example, at the car experience, um, I've never really enjoyed spending half a day at a car dealership. Um, first, making the decision to buy, then sitting there getting cross-sold in the finance department for everything we don't need, but, you know, it's just an exhausting. And, and this time around, um, I traded in a car without ever having to uh, leave the house. Um, somebody came to the house, bought the car, it was a public company, took the car away, took care of all the d and paperwork, and I was able to get a, a, you know, a fair price. Um, and then I bought the car completely online, had the car delivered to my house, and uh, it was uh, painless. And it's, as more car manufacturers understand that consumers prefer that, you'll probably see others adopting that model. And I'm, I'm seeing the same with a lot of businesses, whether it's ordering your food on, online or ordering a product from a retailer. I, I bought a, um, an Amazon box for the bank from a, a Best Buy, and I ordered online, went to the, the place of business, they brought it to my car and never had to go inside. It was very convenient. And I'm seeing uh, businesses trying to figure out, okay, how do we continue to deal with um, concerns on the consumer's part or the health uh, department and how we serve clients and, and overcome these issues? And just the creativity is wonderful to see. And we're seeing it all, all across the board. That's great, yeah. I see that as well. My, my youngest son is a DoorDash driver. And, you know, they switched over where now the, the uh, default for all the orders is contactless. So he's supposed to leave the, you know, the order on the, on the uh, doorstep. But he's been surprised by the fact that about a third or so of his orders over the last couple of weeks, people have still come out to greet him, right? And so it's interesting. It's an interesting balance between not wanting to have too much contact and stay safe, but also being so fed up with being stuck inside, seeing nobody that you're even willing to come outside and say hello to your DoorDash delivery person. <laughs> Well, we're, we're social creatures uh, by design. So I think we're all seeing examples of that right now where people just want to have that human contact. And exactly. you know, Zoom, Zoom is, um, is good, uh, but it's never the same as really seeing somebody in person. So I think that's going to be a challenge as we go forward. I was talking to uh, uh, CEO, Mrs. Uh, Chair, the other day, and he said he, his members do not want to go back to meeting in person and they're finding it actually more personable to meet via Zoom hmm. after one-on-one -on -one meetings via Zoom. And I thought that was interesting. Wow. I don't know if it's a common sentiment, but I, I find um, many clients uh, are asking me now if I will come visit them again. And um, they want to have the face-to-face. -face. So we're trying to figure that out. I'll show up many times wearing my, my mask. And uh, within a few minutes, they kind of say, you know, if you want to take it off, it's fine with me. And, that, that's becoming more common right now. I think as the fear, maybe rightly or wrongly, is going down, or just the need to have face to face seems to be a, a growing sentiment among these people that I've talked to. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and for someone like me who's been so used to being out and meeting people for coffee and lunches and different events on a regular basis, uh, it's been really tough to, to get away from that. But at the same time, it's hard to know for sure when to go back to it. It's kind of, I kind of leave it up to the person that I'm gonna be talking to or meeting with and say, do you wanna do a phone call, meet via Zoom, or do you wanna meet in coffee based on their comfort level? So uh, I haven't had anybody say yes, let's meet for coffee quite yet, but I see that coming in the next, you know, probably 30 days or so. Yeah. No, definitely. It's a, it's, a, it's a new and untested time for all of us. It is, right, we're all kind of learning as we're going here, definitely. So, um, so Dan, recommendations that you might have for, again, for the small business owners that are, that are you know, listening today uh, about ways that they should be considering a pivot, if you will, or the uh, addition of new services out there? Well, first and foremost, reach out to your, your peers in your industry that are not directly competing with you across the nation. I think most of us have, have um, the ability to do that, whether it's to a trade association, contacts you make because somebody in your industry is probably already working on solutions that maybe you haven't thought about and they're happy 
to share if we're not directly competing in your market space. I've seen that quite often. And then talk to uh, other CEOs in industries that are somewhat aligned, maybe in the service sector or the manufacturing sector and find out what they're doing because everyone is, is open to sharing right now and they're happy to do so. I, I was looking in the business journal the last three weeks and almost every other story was an example of somebody pivoting and sharing their story with the newspaper. And you, you could come up with at least uh, 50 examples in the last three weeks. And if you read it and you think, well, how would I apply that in my business? Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't take uh, a great deal of stretching to take some of these ideas and figure out that a map across to your own business. So I would say, um, look, look for the information online through peer organizations, through the, the local business journals, and you're going to find um, some great ideas out there. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I mean, even myself, I have, I have a group, uh, two different groups. One is of myself and uh, five other owners of search firms. We meet on a regular, you know, monthly or bi-monthly basis to talk about industry trends, pricing structures, you know, that what we're seeing out there. But I also have a second group that's just a few of us, about four people, and we're all business owners, but of very different businesses. And I find that I, it's nice to have that blend because as I'm thinking about introducing new services or, or recruiting solutions, I can get their feedback from a very objective perspective and, and their potential customers in terms of kind of what their businesses do. So uh, I agree that that, that that peer review, if you will, uh, is a big part of this uh, kind of an effective pivot. Very powerful. Yeah, definitely. We're also doing a lot of workshops now where I'm bringing in um, subject matter experts and, and encouraging those who have an interest in these topics to meet on Zoom. Maybe it's, you know, if you're going to sell your business, well, when do you start that process? How far in advance? Or if you're looking to take on um, a new type of digital marketing, there's so many different ways of approaching that. And so I'm bringing in uh, expert speakers on a wide range of topics and then putting it out to our to our clients. And uh, if, if anybody on this call has a topic that they think would be of interest, just approach me and I'll set you up. And that might be a way to drive revenues to your firm, but also fill a need that, uh, that the clients have. That's a great idea, definitely. And I think, I think the kind of collaboration, if you will, is going to be the name of the game, at least for the rest of this year, but uh, probably you know, far into the future also. Um, interesting question from one of our members also from Greg asking about whether you, the, the uh, manufacturing clients that you have are expecting to see increased revenue and in business as a result of all the backlash and the issues with China, right? With, you know, tariffs is one thing, but just in general, there's been a lot of articles lately in the Wall Street Journal also talking about China and the separation in, in, in business cultures, but also in terms of reliance and trust of, of that country. Are you seeing anything um, among, among your clients, uh, manufacturing clients in that regard? Most definitely. There, there's almost all the manufacturers are doing well right now, and, and I'm including everything from furniture to carving up pieces of metal for different fabrication needs, job shops as we call them. And, um, most have seen um, kind of a Buy America theme um, for whatever reason. Um, uh, some of it is, I think, saw with the pharmaceuticals that we realized that a high percentage of the pharmaceuticals in the country were, were imported, uh, usually from China. And I think people are starting to look at that and say, well, when you have uh, countries that are quarantined for a period of time and there's a supply chain interruption, right. is that a smart way to run a business, to put all of our eggs in one basket? And so you're, you're seeing an uh, emphasis now on sourcing locally uh, more so than ever, just, just because of awareness, I think. So yeah, a lot of our clients are uh, enjoying a very good time right now in manufacturing. Yeah, yeah and with the issues in Hong Kong as well, and you know, if, if both sides follow through on that, that's going to be interesting in terms of just the, the financial hub that Hong Kong has become and just a great, great connecting point uh, for the U.S. also. That also ends up coming up under under China rule, it's, it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be in the next couple of years are gonna be a, a def, definitely a sea change. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, very good. All right, so we have a, a couple minutes left here. Uh, any parting thoughts, again, for small business owners for us to, to you know, kind of weather this storm, if you will, um, whether it's related to PPP. I assume there's still, there's still money available for this in the second round of PPP loans, correct? Yeah, there's plenty of funds available and we will, Quit making uh, uh, those loans on June 30th by law, and I don't see the funds running out before June 30th. So if anyone still needs it, they, they won't have a problem getting those. Um, 
some banks have stopped just because they have uh, capacity limitations that they self-impose upon themselves. But there's there's a bank somewhere in the country that will make a PPP loan, no doubt. Um, parting advice is really to uh, just remember that as a business owner, um, you know, you've already taken uh, some risks that others would never take. And the ingenuity that you have to start your business is the same that's going to help you come through this. And I, I cannot tell you how impressed I am right now at so many business owners who are not giving up, uh, not throwing in the towel, but are they're really taking advantage in many cases of the PPP uh, capital infusion, which is what it led up being, to uh, uh, re reposition their companies. And if they do that well, uh, those jobs will come back in time. And so, uh, the, boy, it is just amazing the number of examples I could give you for hours on end of companies that have already changed their business model in just two months. So if somebody isn't in that position, um, they need to really seek out uh, information from others that, that are in their industry because I think they're going to find they can do it too. I agree. I think that's, that's great advice. I mean, and even for us as well and, and some of my clients, we've really kind of peeled back to the core of what it is that we do. You know, yes, we are recruiters, but at the end of the day, we're all about making connections, right? So when you think about other ways to pivot your business or new lines of business to offer and help out those clients that need support, you know, going back to the core of what you do is kind of the first step, right? And yes, we, d we deliver those connections by way of recruiting, but let's take it back a step further and figure out how we can do that in a different manner potentially. And I have colleagues of mine that are doing the same kind of thing with their businesses, whether it's catering, as you talked about, whether it's uh, manufacturing companies moving over to doing masks. But I think, you know, certainly another, you know, silver lining in all of this uh, craziness is that companies you know, are now realizing how, how versatile, right, they really are, uh, how innovative they really are, and how, you know, once they take a step back and take a breather from the day to day, they realize, wow, we really have a lot of opportunity out there. It's not going to be easy. Um, but as a small business, we can be much more agile uh, than the big boys and girls out there. There was a story in the journal about a company called Sourceify. They were primarily sourcing out of China for companies that needed product. Well, now they're setting up schools, uh, e-commerce e schools, to teach individuals how to create their own businesses around sourcing product from outside the U.S., and they're having as much success teaching others how to do it as they were doing it themselves. And it's, uh, it's a great article in the business journal if you haven't seen it. Yeah, I saw that. No, you're exactly right. Yeah, and who would have, that was probably not something they would have considered if they weren't forced into it with all these changes out there. So uh, it really does, you know, crisis definitely kind of uh, forces uh, innovation without question. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Well, so you mentioned before, Dan, that if people have interest in connecting with you or some of the groups that you're running on a networking basis, should they reach out to you via, uh, via LinkedIn? Is that the best way to do it? Yeah, LinkedIn or shoot me an email and provide that to them. Happy okay. to, to uh, get them in front of our clients. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, and then last reminder, also, if you are looking to be in our success trios and quads, please just shoot an email over to Elaine and we'll get those arranged and, and set back also. Uh, and we also are recording this as we always do. It'll be up on our SMLA page, if not by Friday, certainly by Monday, uh, if you want to look at it again and, and uh, kind of hear some of the comments that were made and some of the suggestions that were, that were brought forth too. So thank you all for being here. I hope you have a good and nice and cool afternoon. Uh, Dan, as always, thank you for the insights. I could talk to you for hours and hours. I just love hearing all the, all the examples of what you're uh, seeing out there. So thank you for sharing that. It's wonderful. And, uh, hope everyone had a chance to uh, enjoy uh, some of the information we shared today. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you uh, next time. It's uh, the 26th of the month is uh, the next event, and we will see you then. Take care. You Bye. too. Thanks, Dan.